what is the worst locomotive ever? And I mean, like, literally the worst. Now, I'm sure most of you are well aware that we've... We've talked about a lot of really... Really bad... <laughs> really bad locomotives. Train sets and the, the, everything uh, over over this channel's existence, and, and, it, and it, it we've hit a point where where I'm like, yeah, but what's really the genuine worst one? Like out of all of them, consider we have 25 parts of worst trains ever. At five locomotives apiece, that's 125 locomotives and train sets. And technically, it should be a little bit more than that, because there were a few multi-entries, so it's a little closer to 130. The point is, I've talked about a lot of them, but I never really zeroed in on which one is the absolute 100%, yeah, seriously, this one was trash, worst ever. I just kind of generalized it. So I decided to make a list where I talk about what I think, out of all the ones I've talked about, are actually... The worst. And I had a few rules to go by. The first one, and main one actually, is that there can't be any experiments. A lot of the worst ones I talked about were experimental units. And yeah, a lot of those were bad, but they were experimental. So you can kind of defend them on the basis that they were just testing them to see if they actually worked. They didn't. But that's what experiments are. Now I still included them on the other list because they were still bad. But if we're talking about absolute worst, I would say that it's much worse for something to enter production and be, like, used by a railway in proper service and then be bad, rather than being just a one-off experiment. Another factor I wanted to consider, too, was other uses, as some of the really bad locomotives were put into a role that they really should never have been in in the first place. There were a few that were really bad at pulling passenger trains, for example, but when coupled to freight, they were actually alright. So you have to consider that, too. I also had to look into whether or not they were ever fixed at all, as many locomotives do start out with horrific teething issues, but then later, they do get fixed. But regardless of all that, I have narrowed it down to the top five actual, legitimate, worst trains ever, based on my own analysis. Oh boy. The Bud SPV 2000. These were supposed to be self-propelled diesel multiple units built by the Bud Company between 1978 and 1981. They built 31 of them, though they planned on making more and wound up with 14 unassembled shells. And they were operated by several different railways, actually, including Amtrak and Metro North. They were supposed to be pretty high speed, reaching 120 miles per hour, 190 kilometers per hour, and SPV stood for Special Purpose Vehicle, and was meant to emphasize the design's suitability for both intercity and commuter rail service. They bear a passing resemblance to the Amfleet passenger coaches, which were actually based on another Bud product that was really bad, the Bud Metroliner. But I didn't think the Metroliners were quite as bad as the SPV 2000s, because at least the Metroliners sometimes worked. But the 2000s never seemed to have. They were mechanically unreliable from the start, and were generally always pulled by locomotives, making sure the crews felt the SPV actually stood for seldom powered vehicles. Amtrak withdrew them pretty quickly by 1986 and replaced them with conventional locomotive hauled Amfleet trains. Metro North kept them around a little longer, but they generally sat in storage with most just being depowered permanently because they were just sick of their nonsense. They weren't working. And in terms of being a self-propelled vehicle of any kind, it kind of puts you at the top tier of worst if you never actually move under your own power. The only benefit the SPV 2000s had is that when they moved, they were a pretty smooth ride. So yeah, they could be used as regular passenger coaches, but what does it even say? Like, how is that helping? That's not helping. That's not helpful at all. This is ridiculous. Incredibly, two actually wound up in preservation. Metro North 293 and Condot 1001. The latter of which is actually being restored at the Danbury Railway Museum in Danbury, Connecticut. 
quite why they're doing that, I... I don't know, I mean, I, I mean, I'm always for preservation, but is it worth it? Is it? Is it worth it? I don't know, ask Danbury. But these are trash. The Baldwin Lima Hamilton RP-210. Oh, Baldwin. How the mighty have fallen. The RP-210s were supposed to be Baldwin's attempted entry into the lightweight passenger locomotive market. They only ever built three of them, and they were actually diesel hydraulic, technically, but that was only when they were even operating as diesels, because as part of the design, they were also meant to operate off of pantograph lines and a third rail if need be. They could do all three. As a result, they were actually among the most complex railroad locomotives in America, and that did Baldwin no favors when it came to actually making them work because they, they, they generally didn't. They utilized a German prime mover, hence why it was a hydraulic transmission. And while technically there were three, technically there were two different models. New Haven had two of them and New York Central had one. Now, the locomotives were all sisters, but between New Haven and New York Central, there were differences making them not physical or even mechanical twins. The most clear and obvious difference was that New York Central's had the shark nose design that Baldwin was known for, whereas New Haven's had a more traditional square. And even before they were built, there were already problems. So like I said, they were mechanically complex and required three different methods for generating power. In order to meet this requirement, New Haven's Bronx-based Von Nest electrical shops initially fitted the units with one third rail contact shoe per side. But experience with the setup showed that locomotives generally required two power collection shoes per side, as widely spaced as possible. That was because, well, one of them could fail, but that wouldn't necessarily make it so that the locomotive couldn't operate at that point. The Von Nest engineers and mechanics scrambled to design a full length support bracket for the RP-210's lead truck and they attached an unconventional contact shoe assembly to it. They did complete it, but that was just before the pre-inaugural press run of the train, which was scheduled for January 7th, 1956. And the shop supervisors actually advised against putting the new third rail shoes into service because they hadn't been tested yet, though they were overruled by a supervisor. This would prove to be a really bad call when during the inaugural run, while pulling a train with New Haven's president, George Alpert, and about 225 different newsmen, promoters, and politicians, the contact shoe misaligned and caused a ground arc of electricity, which set the locomotive's truck ablaze. But that didn't go so well. But in case you think they were better in other areas, you would be wrong. See, even if they were operating off of pantograph lines, they were still an issue because they were short. The RP-210s were only about 11 feet tall, this meant that traditional roof-mounted pantographs wouldn't actually be able to go high enough to reach the overhead wires. So they had to fit it with a small diamond-style pantograph in order to obtain the required height. During their operational lives, which didn't last long, all the units suffered frequent mechanical issues and they never even rode very well. They were rough on the rails. And road mechanics were unfamiliar with the foreign prime mover. Remember, it was German and it was diesel hydraulic. They had to sift through metric hardware components at local Volkswagen dealerships to try to fix them, and the maintenance manuals supplied for the diesel engines were only available in German, which the vast majority of the mechanics couldn't even read. So thank you. Thank you for that. Really, everything was going wrong with these things. Crews took to calling the RP-210s, which had been originally meant to pull New York Central Railroad's Explorer train, the Exploder because of how frequently everything went wrong on them. Naturally, it wasn't long before the things were finally withdrawn, and all three were sent for scrap. The New South Wales 41-class locomotive. Proof that I am not being America-centric with this list, because everyone in the world can produce terrible things equally well. The 41-class were diesels, built by British Thompson Euston in the United Kingdom, but for the New South Wales Department of Railways in Australia. They were diesel electric, constructed in 1953 and 1954, 
and they only ever made 10 of them. The order was actually placed by New South Wales to the Australian General Electric Company, but they sublet the contract out to British Thompson Houston. They first entered service in December of 1953. From their very first early days of service, they had problems, and by problems I mean they caught fire! That's seemingly a major critical issue, and just a forewarning, I kind of put most locomotives that have the potential to murder somebody in a category all their own in terms of being terrible. Like, yeah, the SPV 2000s just flat out didn't work, but that act of not working probably wouldn't have gotten anybody killed, whereas the 41 class was, was much, much far and away more likely to do that. The issue seemed to be down to their radiators, which were relocated further to the ends of all 10 of the locomotives, and the air ducting was modified to try to fix their problems. And while it did make it so they were less likely to explode, they still weren't considered great. They were designed for multiple unit operation, but they basically never did that, because due to the way the radiators were laid out, heat from the first locomotive would pass to the second, and then the second would catch fire. Y you see the problem here? They just flat out removed the multiple unit operation equipment because there was no point. They couldn't do that. They continued using them as best they could, but they never really stopped having problems. And they were all withdrawn by 1975. Though, amazingly, one did manage to make it into preservation. 4102. The New Zealand Government Railways are M-Class, otherwise known as the 88-seater because they had 88 seats. Is that a serious question? Did you not know? In the early 1950s, like many places in the world, New Zealand was in the process of replacing their steam traction with diesels, and they were trying to modernize as they were actually experiencing an increase in traffic at the time. They wanted to introduce rail cars, which by that point were known to be much more efficient. And these, of course, would be diesel powered. As far as who was going to construct it, well, English Electric was interested, but the Drury Car Company presented a design for an articulated rail car that seated 88 passengers, and it would use either Hercules or Fiat 210 horsepower engines. They decided to go with Drury, like fools. They subcontracted the thing out, the Birmingham Railway Carriage and Wagon Company, and there were significant delays in even delivering the rail cars. One was even damaged in transit and used for spare parts for the others. The first one was finally delivered in November of 1954, with the last one showing up in May of 1958. But the first did arrive with a lot of fanfare. Local newspapers were excited by the new technology, and then almost immediately they suffered serious overheating issues from ballast dust as well as engine failure. The rail cars often ran late, like pretty much every day. 20 to 30 minutes late, mind you. Oh, and they caught fire! Frequently! Which in some cases had a habit of causing external fires in the farmland and foliage along the tracks. This was due to excessive hot carbon particles and the exhaust emissions. The crankcases weren't strong enough to absorb the power of the diesel engines that drove these things, and those issues were considered so serious that the NZR called a meeting with Drury and Fiat in March of 1957. Ten of the railcars had wrecked crankcases and blown motors. Fiat staff and fitters had to come to New Zealand from Italy to completely rebuild the engines and power systems of every single one of the rail cars. And to their credit, they were a lot better after that, but they still really didn't work that well. By 1971, 10 of them had already been withdrawn due to engine problems, and the rest were all taken out of service by 1978. Yet another case of building a piece of rolling stock that's setting things on fire. Stop doing that! The British Rail Class 21. Oh, no! No, 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 no! Did you have to be the absolute worst? And of course it's the 21. Of course it's the 21. Of course it's the 21. What else would it be? This thing was constructed by the North British Locomotive Company who were really good at building steam engines and not so great at building diesels. 58 were actually produced because British Rail had no chill and every single one of them was complete trash. 
It was the modernization plan, and British Rail was scrambling to replace as many of their steam engines as possible, because if they just replace them with brand new diesels, that'll fix all their financial problems, even though they hadn't tested the new diesels, and a lot of them were garbage. And the Class 21 was the absolute worst of that lot. By a considerable margin! Their engines were of a German design, but they were built under license by the North British Locomotive Company, and they were of inferior quality to the German originals. Their cooling systems weren't adequate, and the engines leaked. On top of that, they weren't constructed to the appropriate tolerances, so their cylinder heads had a habit of fracturing, and lubricating oil escaped into the battery compartments located below the power unit, which was very dangerous, actually. And they caught fire. Because of course they did. A lot of the problems were rectified in a rebuilding program between 1961 and 1962, but it didn't fix all their issues. And there was a time when British Rail just stuck them all into storage and didn't even use them because they could have gotten somebody killed. Even later, British Rail would rebuild them entirely into Class 29s, which were a lot better, but still not great and not standard, so they didn't last long either. The remainder of the 21s were all scrapped, as were all of the 29s, so I guess you should say all of the 21s were scrapped. Every single one of them was out of the scrapyard, because why? Why would you keep these around? Honestly, the only reason I could think of for why you would keep these around is to serve as an example of how not to build a diesel, because pretty much everything about them was terrible. Did I mention they caught fire? And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders, some dude 267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitson 131-232, Josh Johnson, Metal for Life Guy, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Tommy Rossini, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Brian, Jack Carson's Rare Videos, Hayden DeGro, Master of Non, Lorha444, Mark Holding, Murder Drone Stall, A Person723, DM Tribal Typhoon, Alfonso Lapuche, Royal Hunter 2860, Isafer 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Matthew Wolf, Mr. Sleepy, Matt Weaver, Alaric Jaspers, Tom Red Lion, Edis Productions 8104, Hannah Bird, Hendrick Metal Sports Fan 5, Wheeljack 8401, Rescues Greyhounds, Dr. Racer 78, The Baxter, Caleb Crosswhite, Ohio Trucker 1, and Joshua Long. Till next time, this is Darkness, and we dwell a fond farewell.